Hey, this is going to be your first section test, and this video is to help you sort of make sense of what I might be uh, asking you for in terms of this first section test. So, Philosophy 101, section test number one, due Tuesday, October 4th, uh, by noon. Um, there's going to be on each of these tests a lot of boilerplate. I give the course a description from the syllabus of section tests and all relevant policies. You'll see that on each of my assignments um, where I cite the description and the policies related to it that um, that, that, that pertain to this. So um, I'll just start by reading here and then I'll go over each of the questions just to give you an idea of what I'm looking for in terms of uh, response to these kinds of questions. Like I say, the short answer questions um, should be pretty straightforward. Um, the longer answer question I'm going to unpack just a little bit, but nonetheless. Um, taken from course syllabus, um, section tests, this course is divided into three sections consisting of two theorists each. So, um, uh, Socrates and Plato for this one. Right. Um, each of the tests for this course will test the section we're working on only, that is, it, they will not be comprehensive. Each test will consist of uh, questions totaling to 20 possible points, typically five short answer questions asking you to define a term, make an important distinction, etc. Um, related to the particular philosopher and one longer question, uh, questions will be designed to test both reading comprehension and a more general understanding of the ideas that we've studied. That is, readings on all video material that I posted to Moodle or Fair Game um, for all of these tests. So yes, you, you, you have to do all the work. Right. Um, these tests will be posted to Moodle at the end of each section covered by the quiz um, and on the syllabus I indicate the dates. Um, you will have at least five days to engage um, with this test material. Your responses are be t uh, to be submitted through Moodle. Um, note late assignments will be accepted. Important caveat on that one, if um, the sky falls, like I was saying on the, uh, the, in the introduction lecture for this course, I have a policy to handle this. You'll find me very accommodating with regard to um, life events. Right? Your dog or your cat dies, you've got a sick family member, you're sick, um, etc. Right? Just the idea is that if you want me to work with you, you have to work with me. So, in the unfortunate event that you miss an assignment or due date due to serious illness or death in the family or the sky falls, basically, um, it, you must notify me via email or um, by telephone message with the departmental office, either before the date and time in question, that's preferred, or within 12 hours of the deadline or due date, otherwise I won't be able to offer an extension. So, it's if you realize, oh geez, I'm not going to be able to make this deadline, send me an email, call the department, um, I'll get a message, and um, I'll be willing to work with you through, um, through whatever trial um, that you're facing. Um, but it's if you let it go a week or two weeks or something along those lines, it's, it, you see, I have to grade these, and um, part of what I do to grade these is I post model answers and if you've got the answers and the questions and you're writing the test, it's, it's too late at that point, right? So um, I'm willing to work with you if you're willing to work with me and you'll find me very accommodating. But um, you just got to let me know this is a negotiation if you're handing it in late. Uh, assignment submission. Note that it's your responsibility to ensure that your assignments have been properly uploaded to Moodle. When, I, uh, when you submit your assignment, be sure to double check that your upload was successful. If I do not have it, it's not there. All right. Um, so make sure you've properly uploaded to Moodle. And then on top of that, make sure it's the right document that you've uploaded to Moodle. Um, in past semesters, I've had people submitting assignments for other classes, and if I'm accepting that as an assignment, or this assignment, it doesn't address any of the, the, the questions, and again, I don't have it. So make sure that you get me the right assignment and it's properly uploaded. If you're completely freaking out about that and worried about um, proper uploads and stuff like that, and just not sure if it went through, email it to me too.
That way, you're sure I've got it more than one way. All right. Um, so, uh, one last note um, about plagiarism. Familiarize yourself with the course policy and the OEU policy on plagiarism. Um, I know it's going to be tempting looking at these questions and essentially having an open book test to just go online and see what Sparknote says or the, the, the Cheat House or something along those lines. But um, if you can find it, I can find it. I've got a wacky knack of determining exactly, like, of, of, of sort of sensing that what I'm reading didn't come from a student because there are ways that people on the internet and people, you know, academics tend to write that students tend not to. So um, it's really obvious to me. Right? So um, I've got a zero tolerance policy on plagiarism. If you're using any textual material beyond your own reflections, you must provide a reference for your readers so, uh, to the source of that material. So, like, for example, if you're even saying Socrates argues in the Apology, tell me where Socrates argues at the Apology. If you're using words that come from the Crito, tell me where in the Crito it comes from. If you're using Joe Blow's analysis of Plato's Phaedrus online, well, tell me you're using Joe Blow's analysis of Phaedrus online and delineate what's yours from the online, uh, the online source. Uh, the easiest way to write these tests, though, is to just think about what you understand from this material and write it down, right? <laughs> Largely, what you're being assessed for is not internet research, right? I want to know that you've read the material and that you've got a more general comprehension of this material. So read through the OU course, um, uh, the, the, the course and OU policies on plagiarism carefully and ensure that your submitted, submitted work is properly referenced. Um, if you don't know what plagiarism is and you don't know how to avoid it on the syllabus, I give you a, light, a link to SiteRight, which is an online pro training program that will show you how to properly reference and when that is required. Right? It's a very good program. Um, make use of it. It's your responsibility to uh, understand what plagiarism is. I've defined it nicely for you on the syllabus. Um, in terms of a particular reference style, I don't care. Right? Just so long as uh, the principle of, of, of referencing is, is observed. Right? Like, if you say uh, that Plato claims this, I should be able to go and find it right, if I'm looking. That's the idea. So if you're Chicago, you're MLA, you're APA, uh, that sort of thing, it doesn't matter. Right? Not to me. Anyway, you'll find some professors are pickier. So, um, what are you responsible for in this test? Um, Plato's five dialogues, the Apology and the Crito, and Plato's Phaedrus, so what we've studied in course. Um, video material, Rick Roderick, Socrates in the Examined Life video from 1990, That's you've got a link to that on Moodle, you've got links to all of these on Moodle. Um, Philosophy, a Guide to Happiness, Socrates on Self-Confidence, Plato's Theory of the Forms, Beginner, and School of Life, Philosophy, Plato. Right, so those are the videos that you're responsible for, and um, several of them are going to be really quite handy for answering these questions. So, two parts to this short answer questions. There are five short answer questions, we're two points each for a total of 10 points. Um, these are short answer questions, um, and by short, I mean short, uh, requiring between three and five sentences for each response. Um, that's a rule of thumb. Right, um, three sentences is minimal, and expect um, that if you do the bare minimum, that your result will be sort of minimal as well. Right, um, it's better to be clear. Remember, the course objective is to get you writing clearly about theory in your written work. Right, so if you look at that 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 answer that you've provided, and it's vague or unclear or um, something along those lines. You've given me an example but haven't unpacked it. You may actually need to do more work. Right? Um, if you're very concise, very concise, I've seen people succeed quite well on these, 
with very clear, incisive, concise responses of three sentences long, right? But that is the minimum I've ever seen anybody succeed with, right? You'll probably need more, right? Um, so uh, two points each, total 10 points. Um, this is uh, two on Socrates, two on Plato, That's, or three on Plato. Uh, that's how this is laid out here. So Socrates, and I give you the page reference on page 35 of the five dialogues, presents an argument where he compares himself to a gadfly. So uh, that, that directs you to the subject of the question. First part, in what respect is he like a gadfly? So the idea is unpack the metaphor, right? So he says, I'm a gadfly. A gadfly is a gnat, it bites the horse on the ass and shocks the horse to alertness. But in what respect is Socrates like a gadfly? Right? How does he bite the noble steed of the Athenian pop populace, shocking it to alertness? So the first step is unpack that metaphor, right? And why is this important by his argument to the city-state of Athens? Right? Because remember, in the gadfly argument, he's saying that you know this is a valuable service that he provides. He was attached as though by a god uh, to the city. Right? Though it seems a ridiculous thing to say. That's all on page thirty-five. So, right. Unpack the metaphor and talk about why Socrates thinks that the service that he provides is valuable. Then, how might this argument be used to support a case for freedom of speech and, by extension, freedom of the press? Right. So you've got a metaphor, you unpack it and uh, make clear the idea that Socrates believes that there is some sort of social value to his practice, right? And then you move on to the next part of the question, which asks you how this argument might be used to um, support a case for freedom of speech, right? So that's what you do for that question, right? And we discussed that extensively. So, two, in his fictional conversation with the laws of Athens, Socrates introduces the distinct but related notions of the social contract and tacit consent. Define each of um, these notions, distinguishing between them. So, social contract is, tacit consent is, this is how they relate to one another and it, why these two distinct notions are needed by Socrates. And that's a pretty straightforward question. Question three, briefly discuss um, the constitution of the soul. And the, I referenced the passage on page 30 where he's saying it, this is what must be said about the soul structure as well. Offered by Plato at the start of Socrates' second speech. Now, I'm not looking for the argument for the immortality of the soul. It's bad. Just don't engage. There's no point. But what I am looking for is his dis description of the structure of the soul. He uses a metaphor, right? So part one is um, briefly discuss, introduce like Socrates' breakdown of the soul, the constitution of the soul, the structure of the soul. Um, next part, uh, how by, this uh, by the argument offered in this speech does platonic love bring harmony to the soul? Right. So uh, that should be pretty, it's, I mean, it's, it's one of the key features of platonic love. Right. Then question four, um, it's straightforward, but it's complicated. Um, I gave you that um, Plato's Theory of the Forms beginner video, which should be quite helpful to um, your response to number four. Uh, we discussed it in terms of my cat and the idea of cat. Right. Um, so um, briefly introduce Plato's theory of the forms. Right. Tell me what the forms are. Right. So um, that was question four. And then finally, question five, briefly discuss Plato's theory of recollection. Um, and then discuss how platonic love brings us closer to knowledge of the forms, noting the special character of beauty. Right. Um, recall the theory of recollection is an argument that I presented you in lieu of that bad argument for the immortality of the soul. 
um, the theory of recollection is sort of based on the theory of the forms, which we've just, just discussed in question four, um, but it's largely Plato's epistemology. This is what learning is, right? And with regard to his description of the benefits of that fourth kind of madness, love, um, what Plato has done is actually pointed out that beauty actually holds a special status and is very useful with regard to his epistemology. So um, that's part one. Um, should be fairly straightforward. If you have questions about the questions, let me know. Um, part two, the longer answer question, asks you to do something comparative. All right. So um, <coughs> I always think of these questions as preparation for um, your essay, which will come in towards the end of the class. Uh, you'll be presenting an argument here. So longer answer questions require a minimum of three paragraphs in response. And by minimum, I mean just bare, I'm telling you how to get a C. Right? A paragraph consists of a minimum, again, that word minimum, of three sentences. Right? So minimally three, six, nine sentences in response to these questions. That's, that's how you pass. Right. Um, the idea is that you're going to engage with this argument and argue it sort of till it's done. Don't go crazy. Right. Um, I'm looking for about a page in response, more or less. Right. Depending on how you write, depending if you use examples that um, tend to burn a lot of words, that sort of thing. Um, I'm just getting to know you. I don't know how you write yet. Right. So your writing style may be. Uh, very, very prone to circumlocution. That is a round and about way of speaking, right? I, I know I actually, it, you know, I take a while to make a point, right? So that for a question like this, I would probably write more, right? But if you're very concise and very direct, you might be able to do it in less, right? Um, so, right. question. Right? So uh, the goal of this section is to make short, a short argumentative account of the material at hand as directed by the question below. So you're presenting an argument. It's one question. It's worth 10 points. That's half the test, right? Question. In the Apology, while defending himself against his accusers, Socrates argues that he could not, been, uh, could not have been guilty of corrupting the youth deliberately, but must have done so unwillingly if he did so at all. That's on page 30 of your five dialogues. This reveals a nuance of Socrates' position, one that shows that he holds that nobody acts wickedly deliberately. Wickedness by this argument arises out of ignorance. So remember, this is one I presented to you, the Socratic dicta, right? Um, so um, it's arguable that Plato, through his treatment of the constitution of the soul that we saw in the Phaedrus, that is uh, the structure of the soul, what the soul is like, right, um, that you just answered a question on, right, expands the moral psychology of Socrates' account um, uh, for how one could know the good yet fail to do the good. See Phaedrus, um, Socrates' second speech, right briefly introduce each of these arguments, um, followed by a brief comparative account of these positions, right? Um, so, right, uh, the idea is, um, the step one would be to introduce Socrates' position in your own words, right? Making clear what I just gave you, right? Um, the trick is to go beyond what I just gave you in the question too, right? Um, it, recount the argument from Socrates and or generally talk about this this notion that comes out of Socrates that those that know the good do the good and evil arises as an involuntary error due to ignorance, right? Um, talk about some of the consequences, right? So for example, well, it's, I, I just gave you, so it, like Socrates does not seem by this argument to have a mechanism for someone knowing what the right thing to do is and bloody well just not doing, right? or knowing what they're about to do is wrong and just bloody well doing it anyway, right? So that seems to be a weak spot in Socratic philosophy. Plato's uh, Constitution of the Soul, which you introduced in the question, so it should be in easy to introduce it 
in um, this question, right, um, so in part one you introduced the constitution of the soul. It should be an easy matter of saying uh, Plato thinks the soul is like this, right? Now, what this does, and we discussed this in class, is add sort of a nuance to the moral of psychology, a mechanism by which somebody could uh, comprehend what is best, yet be dragged off in a di different direction by one of the parts of the soul. Right? So um, that's more or less the problematic I'm asking you to engage with. Um, the idea here is to um, offer an argumentative account, right? Maybe you want to defend Socrates against the charge. You want to claim that Socrates is well aware of this aspect coming from Plato as evidenced by the structure of his argument in the Apology, right? And Plato's addition of this, um, this, 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 this treatment of the soul doesn't really offer all that much, right? You could argue that, um, in fact, Plato's account of the soul is quite nuanced and allows us to, not just in terms of erotic kind of situations, but in terms of all sorts of situations, understand uh, the internal conflicts that are present within us. Right? Uh, you could you could argue this any number of ways. Right? You could argue that they're compatible with one another. Right? Just take a position and argue it. Right? Is the idea. So, and that's why you need multiple um, paragraphs. I say three because here's Plato, here's Socrates, here's Plato, here's my argument. All right. And I say three paragraphs because that would be, uh, you know, just sort of the minimum that I would consider right, necessary for answering this, qu uh, this question. All right. So that's your first test. Um, you have till Tuesday uh, at noon. That's before our class in order to engage with this material. Um, if you have any questions, I checked my email over the weekend, so um, I should be able to respond. Um, of course, I'll be limited. I, I, I'm it, sorts of things I won't do. Uh, hi, professor. Can you look over what I'm um, writing for a response to this question? Tell me if I'm, I'm on the right track. No, I'm not going to pre-grade your essay or your, your, your test, right? I'm not going to do that. Uh, hello, Professor. I'm wondering, in his fictional conversation with the laws of Athens, uh, uh, Socrates um, introduces distinct and related, related notions of social contract, uh, the social contract and tacit consent. Could you define each of these notions for, for me and distinguish between them? I won't just answer a question for you. Um, what I will do, though, is um, coach you. Right? I will direct you to relevant passages. I will point you in the direction of uh, the, the material you need in order to answer these questions. Right. So um, it, let me know if you need any help. I'd be more than happy to do what I can. And um, I look forward to reading your response.